So yesterday, we I believe we stopped after describing this particular page. We talked about different machine learning uh, paradigms. So when we talk about the association with the popular example being the basket analysis, that is often very popular among the uh, business people, especially the, the retailers and the wholesalers in terms of trying to, to kind of, the people who don't believe in it, call it manipulate their uh, uh, customers. So like I explained yesterday in that previous video, so instead of if they notice people purchase item A and B continuously, the, the next time they are going to rearrange the shopping mall, they make sure that those two items are not together. So that while you pick one, you look for the second one, you can be seeing other goods items that are displayed. Now, so it has its own, to the business people, it's an advantage, but to the customer who might not know, he might ended up wasting his time. Corrada, I would have preferred that. If you know I'm going to buy two products, why don't you put them together for me so that I can, I can buy it and leave? However, they look at the advantage from their point of view that, okay, at least you need to check out and see other things that are available that you might like. For the supervised learning, which is going to really be the main stuff that we are going to be able to discover more, maybe in the next uh, class sessions, or uh, towards the end of this, if possible. Uh, we said this is where we have data set that already kind of uh, that has output. So we call it supervised learning because we want the system to learn, to understand what is going on. And for it to understand what is going on, we give the input and also the output. We give the input and we give the output. And we ask the system to try and understand what is the relationship between the input and the output? What is making patient number one that visited the clinic with some attributes, the weight, the age, is he male or female, and some other clinical data that could have been taken. So what is making that particular patient number one to be considered to be suffering from a particular disease? We say one. The second patient that has been checked with all those attributes is considered no, it's not having that disease. So what is the relationship? Why is the system able to, why is this mad considered a diabetic, for example? Why this one is not? So, so when we give this data to the system, we provide the label. This is called supervised learning. So we didn't allow the system to wonder about, try to understand what is going on. So this is called supervised learning, and it is the, uh, I want to say the, maybe the, the easier one and the most likely one to use and get good result, by the way, because for unsupervised learning, we don't pray to have it because it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's kind of an, an abnormal situation whereby we don't know the history very well. We just have data set of people from a clinic. We don't know maybe they suffer before from a disease or not. It's very hard. So still, we can still be able to try and use clustering to understand, okay, what is this one? What is the relation between them as we are going to see it? So this is supervised learning. And we say there are major two types of them, which is classification and regression. For classification, we want to predict what we call a, a kind of a label. So, the student will pass an exam or the student will not pass an exam. That is classification. So why regression is what is going to be the actual mark that the student will score in the final exam, like 35.5 or 40.0, the actual value, that is regression. So we're going, we are going to take supervised learning in more detail later, and we're going to discuss on some of the algorithms that have been used. And then the other one we also mentioned was unsupervised learning with the example being a clustering, or sometimes we use it for dimensionality reduction. We're trying to understand the pattern in the data. You see, we study the, the, we study the nature of the data and we try to understand how it, it actually, uh, what are the attributes? How are they distributed? So that we can classify them into two sections or even more sessions. Then we have the semi-supervised learning where we have, it's in between the two. That is, is a kind of a combination of uh, uh, 
uh, what we call mixed label data with large unlabeled data. The majority of the data are not labeled. Some of them are labeled. Sometimes we use in what we call active learning. So interactive supervised learning, whereby whatever output we get, we give a feedback, okay, this is how it should be. <clears throat> Sometimes you have your email. So, so some emails are classified as spam for you. Me, why they are not spam? They are email from your boss or from your brother or thereabout. But it has gone to your spam email. So you sometimes you need to remove it back and put it to the inbox. When you put it into the inbox, an alert is going to be sent to your mail provider, email provider. That is maybe you are using Gmail also. That, oh, this email was mistakenly classified as spam, but it has been identified as not being spam. So the system at the back end, we try to retrain itself to know that, okay, next time I see this kind of mail, it shouldn't go to the spam. That's the kind of active learning that is continuously, even after deploying the system, the learning process continues. Your feedback would assist in make it even becoming better. So then we have the reinforcement learning, which are uh, not, not, not commonly used, but they're also very powerful, powerful, becoming powerful these days, especially with the coming of deep learning and some other games and uh, policy. It's a policy-based system whereby you, the policy sequence of outputs, so which could be, it learns from the mistake of algorithm, so based on the feedback from the environment. You allow the system to do something. After doing that, we give you feedback. Is it correct or is it not correct? So it's used in a lot of real life robotics and some other applications. So I gave an example yesterday that is an example of you have a child that has done something good. So you give a thumb up and you give a kind of gift to reinforce that behavior in that child, that what you have done today is excellent, continue to do it. In the other way around, if you do something that is not good, you want to make it clear and reinforced in this mind that no, next time don't do this, it's not good. You can start with, is it negative? It could be punishment, it could be extinction actually. We have different policy in this level. We have opportunity later, maybe in future to go into more details about this uh, idea. So, so these are the example of the supervised learning, the classification. You can see how we partition into two. Yeah, so we can see the class, the, the classification. For example, you want to decide if somebody is due, is qualified to take a loan from a particular bank, or you want to decide if the e this email is spam or not spam. This is classification. Why for regression? Is it, you want to predict continuous value like stock market, like greatest score, what is the temperature for the day and host of other possibilities. So, and this is care for supervised learning because we are going to dip more into supervised learning. So like I said, is the, is the most realistic one to really use to get accurate result or better performance. Others are used as supporting system to them like unsupervised learning like clustering, we can use clustering as a pre-processing to supervise learning. Later, uh, we know some of these and how to do them. So usually in supervised learning, when you have the data, you divide your data into two. See, we have the training set, and then we're gonna have the, the testing set. For the training set, so it could be an image like this. So we give this to the system during the training, and we tell the system that, look, this image that is coming in is an apple. This is called training level. So while you are doing the training, I give you this image. Once it gets to this particular, uh, this is the algorithm, it's inside here. We provide the label that the image that just came in is an apple. So we give, give them one after the other. This is tomato. This is cow, auntie. All the data samples have been provided. So the system keep learning, keep trying to understand it. What is indeed that make it to be in an apple? What is in this one that make not to be an apple? What of this tomato, what is making this one to be different from this? The system trying to understand and tomatoes come with different sizes, you can see. That's why we have to provide as many tomatoes as possible so that the system can be able to have a system that can differentiate between not just 
one tomato and the other tomato, but between tomato and apple and other animals. So once we are done with the training, we are providing labels, we call a learn model, this is the final model. So this final model now will be provided, will be taken as our final program. If we remember yesterday, we mentioned that the system says in machine learning, we want to provide in data and output and let the system generate a program. You see, that's what, that was what I referred to as automating the automation. So this is what has taken place. So I provide the data about this apple, maybe the length, the breadth, and host of others. Then I tell the system, this is the output. So this is the output. So this is an output here. I said, the one coming in is an apple. The next one, this is tomato. I, until I've done for everything. So the final outcome is a program, which I also call hypothesis function. We're going to talk about that in more detail later. So this hypothesis function now has represented, or is representing the entire data that has been provided here. This is what we call the program, or you call it the learned model, or the hypothesis function. The H, maybe it could be H4, as the case may be. Because for every algorithm you use, there's what we call the hypothesis space. Inside the hypothesis space, you have a very big possibilities there. We have H1, H2, H3, up to Hn. There are a lot of possibilities. So when I provide the first one, Apple maybe try to look for the hypothesis function that can know the relationship between why is this one a Apple? Maybe it pick H1. By the time I provide tomatoes, at that point, H1 might not be able to recognize that why is this tomato and the first one is apple? It has to keep looking for another H, another hypothesis function. Because at the end of the day, we must end up with only one hypothesis function, not many, only one. So it will start looking for, is there any hypothesis function that can correctly identify this apple number one and the tomato number one that has been provided? Maybe H3 is able to do the work. Good. It will select H3. Then, do we have more data? Yes, we have more data. Then, this is provided. This is a cow. Now, H3 that has been selected as the hypothesis function now may not be able to recognize the three. It can recognize these two, one and two. But when you provided this cow, it got confused. It couldn't recognize all the three. Then, we have to keep searching for the hypothesis function again inside that space big H with several possible small H. So as we go on searching, maybe we end up having maybe H16. That was H, hypothesis function H16, that is able to recognize all the three that have been provided, these, these, and these. But yeah, we have more data. So as you bring in new sample, the hypothesis function keep changing until we have a final hypothesis function after searching through the best that we have gotten is like H95. There's an hypothesis function called H95. Now, it's able to recognize all the data sets, data samples, maybe except two or three. Out of like, a, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven times six. It's able to recognize all with the, by make, with three mistakes. That is, as, that is okay. Because sometimes you might not be able to have 100% accuracy in training. If I, we are going to discuss that. Having 100% in training might, 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 might be a sign of bad thing to happen because it could be what we refer to as overfitting. Overfitting could have happened. Overfitting means the system only memorized this thing. When we have new data that has never been seen before, it might not be able to do it. Because the essence of supervised learning is we want the previous data to be able to, to generate a model, an H, that when we have new sample now, it can provide better results. Now, let's assume that we finally settle for H95, H95. That's the hypothesis function that is doing the better work. All others are getting more errors compared to H95. So we stop at H95. 
So now when we are at the testing stage, we now bring in an image that has never been seen before. This is a totally new apple. Never seen before during the training set. Now we get the features, the image feature, we extract the image features, and then we bring in the learn model here. You can see the learn model is here. We bring it here. So we pass this image in. Notice something. There's no more label. We are not providing label anymore because this is testing. We already trained our system. If you are trained enough, you should be able to pass this exam. It's just like you have your student in class. You taught them everything in class. If you see this, this is how to identify. If you see this, this is how to identify. It's the same thing we have done to our machine. Now it's time to do the testing. You don't tell your student the exam questions. Now we pass it through, it's checked, and find out that it makes prediction. Oh, this is an apple. Then next, we can have as many test sample as possible. It keeps, oh, this is an apple also. So maybe out of 20 test samples, it's able to recognize maybe 18 or 17. Out of 20, that's, that is okay, that is good. So this is how supervised learning actually takes place in summary. So divide your data into true. You have the training set and you have the testing set. So the training is you to build the model that generate the learn model, which I call learn model, or we call it program, or we call it the hypothesis function. We'll come back to that one later. What is really the hypothesis function? It could be an equation. It could be a set of rules that are used to identify the system you have built. Next. Every machine learning system pass through this procedure. See, it's an iterative process. I want us to take note of this. Every machine learning system pass through what we call iterative procedure. That is, you might not be able to get it right at a go. Regarding what I was saying, I said, machine learning process, irrespective of the type you are using, actually have these procedures that the starting point is the data preparation. You have to prepare your data, get the data ready. Then the next is to do the, what we call feature engineering. So extract your features, what are the features that are very important, that are necessary. So each of those, each of these procedures like data preparation is a whole topic on its own. So feature engineering is another very big aspect, but we try to summarize as much as possible. Then, once you have your feature engineering done, you go to algorithm, data modeling, data modeling. This is where the actual learning takes place. During the data, the, the, the data modeling stage, you provide the algorithms. And the shares of algorithms also, like I mentioned last time, depend on the experience of the developer. So there's no algorithm that is always better. So we have to try and see which one is going to work for our data. Like I said, it's very important that we have let the data speak. Let the data speak. This is the principle we are going to be referring to. The data will go a long way to determine if the algorithm is going to be good or otherwise. Of course, there are very, some very smart algorithms that work in, some of, in most of the cases. However, you cannot guarantee that it's always going to work. Now, so when we bring in the algorithm, so and the learning process, takes place successfully, like we described, which we have described here earlier, how this procedure we presented earlier. So the next is to check the performance of the model. We have trained the model, we've tested it. Is the performance okay? Is the accuracy, it could be the accuracy, it could be the root mean square error and host of others. Sometimes if it's not okay, we might need to go back to do the modeling better. Here, maybe we need to do optimization. We may need to do optimization here, trying to see which of the, which of the parameters of the algorithm or hyperparameter will be better to get better result. So sometimes we may need to just even change the algorithm altogether. Yeah, in machine learning, you do a lot of, if you pardon me to call it try and error. Yeah, you have to use an algorithm, use different ones to be able to see which one will work for this data because you cannot just look at data and know the algorithm that's going to work. That's, that is why I always refer people to let the data speak. 
you might see a very powerful algorithm in one data. You use the same algorithm for another problem, another data entirely, it doesn't work. So that's why sometimes we have to have this tick right here, this looping, you keep going back, maybe optimizing or even changing the algorithm altogether. Sometimes you might need to go back to your feature engineering to make this better. Maybe the features you are using are not really good. You may need to select better features. You may need to merge multiple features to become one, depending on the problem you are solving. There are a lot of things involved that are involved in feature engineering. Sometimes then you do the feature, and you go back again. You don't this like a loop. You give go back. Here also a small loop is created. Here a, a little bigger loop. Sometimes you might need to go back to the beginning. Maybe your data is very bad. It's not clean. Your data is dirty. There's a lot of outliers in your data set. You might need to clean the outliers. And there are so many methods of cleaning your data. How do we clean our data? There could be missing values in your data that is affecting the work. So you need to fix the missing value. How do we fix missing values? These are also other topics that are very important, in, but time will not allow us to go in details. We can always engage with ourselves. Uh, in our uh, in our provided uh, YouTube forum where we discuss all these the, um, topics earlier or later that we're going to be discussing them so that we can learn more in detail about them. Now, because time will not permit us to go into each and every one, every one of them. Now, then the next we want to look at is when is machine learning used? We said it is used often when the human expertise does not exist. For example, navigation on mass, routine folding, some tough thing that people don't know how to do. Machine learning has been deployed to go and study how do we think this thing will be. Human can't explain their experts like speech recognition, vision. Sometimes we want to be able to recognize when people write. We want something that can be able to detect the handwriting of the owner of a particular checkbook of a particular owner of an account. People can forge the handwriting, but there are some things you cannot forge, but human being cannot differentiate this system. So we have a system that can deal with that. Model must be customized or personalized. Sometimes we have a system that we have a lot of data that are wasting away. Can't we take advantage of those data to do something that human being cannot do? I give an example, you see, these days, we have several cases whereby people are living fine. They look, they look okay. However, suddenly they have a very small pain in one part of the body. When they visit the clinic, unfortunately, clinic do diagnose people, oh, we are sorry. It is a late stage chronic disease. It could be diabetic. It could be diabetes. We have seen even cancers. They say, oh, we are sorry. It's a late stage. The question is then, why do we wait? It means this guy has been suffering this for a long time, but there's no way doctors can do this. You see, things that we cannot do as human beings, we cannot ask everybody to go to a clinic and do tests for yourself. Even if you do tests, how many tests do you want to do? See, which means people will continue to live with this kind of element. And this element, it has been established that if you can detect it earlier, you can actually prevent the, the, the complication. Treating it become easier, of course, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but letting it get late, create more trouble, financial burden to the, to the country and also to the people that are concerned. So this is why one of the latest area we do work on, so, like someone asked yesterday, machine learning is not only about prediction. Yeah, I love to mention this and clarify. There are so many things we can do with machine learning. And just like any other field of life, they could be misused. That, that was why I mentioned at the beginning that we promote, we emphasize ethical machine learning, things that can benefit humanity. I used to work profusely with oil and gas. So solving some problems in oil and gas, when you want to drill an oil well, they need to know the nature of that area. Otherwise, they waste money to drill and they find out there's nothing there. So we do some predictive solution that can establish if there could be oil or not. So, but of recent, we decided to diversify more. Of course, we still, we still work with uh, oil and gas solution. 
solution provide uh, problem solving. But recently, personally, I've developed personal interest in the issue of humanity. How can we use machine learning to solve people's problems before it becomes too late? For example, we have a system that is being automated that we want to have a kind of several chronic diseases are going to be automated using machine learning, started like five years ago, so that everyone can have access online. Basic questions will be asked, and the system will check if that person is likely having a particular disease or not. That is not showing, and it is working actually with very high accuracy. Anybody going for maybe medical checkup will find out that, oh, there are so many things because it's not possible for a medical doctor to ask everybody to go to the clinic and do tests. I want to check if you're having disease or not. Meanwhile, these are people that are normal, moving about. So these are some of the areas where machine learning can really be a long, have been used and can serve a lot of uh, purpose, hopefully, to save life. Models are based on huge amount of data. There are situations where the data set are just too huge that human being cannot track it. Our human mind can only manipulate few data sample at a time. The moment the variables become many, we lose count of it. So machine learning comes in handy to solve this kind of problem. This is an example when machine learning is used. This is an hypothetical care case. Let's say we have people, you can see the ad rating. Which one is two? A classical example of a task that requires machine learning. You see, it is very hard to see what makes it two. You see, to some people, this is two. So someone, is it two or three? And people write in different forms. And we have system that every day we need to recognize what is this one writing, what is here and what is not there. So machine learning solve this kind of system easily than what human being can even think of doing. And then others we see on our day-to-day -day activity where machine learning has been used Somebody is trying to use a card online. There are systems now that are being deployed to identify that is it a fake user or an authentic user? You see? So you want to know, I mentioned this yesterday, autonomous driving car, the car that drives itself. It into every minute, every second, need to take pictures, the car in front of me, or deploy some sensors. Is it raining? Is a car in front of me? What is the distance between the car and me? Should I stop? Should the stop be very heavy or a small brake is enough? Several predictive solutions are installed in these cars. Need to check, should I, not make, should I make a U-turn? To what degree? 30, 15, depending on the system. So these are some of the areas where machine learning are being used. And they are proposed that they'll be able to drive car better than human beings. So time will tell because they say when you drive, you uh, you use your phone, which is very dangerous. They say autonomous driving car will never use a phone. It's going to be 100% concentrated, concentrating on the task. So because driving a car while you are using phone is like driving without actually the thinking faculty. Because as human beings, it has been established. We cannot do two things at a time. You get carried away with the conversation. So this is my only two way of asking us to drive safely while avoiding dangerous driving. Also, we have a lot of drug discovery and host of others we're gonna mention later. So Facebook had, they want to know if you're going to click a particular thing on the Facebook. So ahead of time, they will know if you're going to click this or not. The like recommendation system that will know if you purchase a book, when you go online to search for something, you see a lot of suggestions coming to you because they look at people from your country. Whenever they purchase that thing, they always, they always purchase something. They try to make recommendation system for you. This is our system that ordinarily might not be possible for human being to work on. So we quickly go through some of the successful machine learning applications. For example, we have the speech recognition. So computer vision, like mail sorting, they sort your mail as it comes in. They try to see, is this mail supposed, if you have seen a very big uh, post office or email center, you see the way this time being sort. One of the very earliest application was the use of this kind of system, computer vision, to sort fish. 
See, when you have very big fish company, when the fish that are coming, you have some very costly fish, another one simple fish. There are videos, picture, cameras have been installed. As they are coming in, they are recognizing they are, okay, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is kingfish, this is a uh, tuna, they are sorted appropriately. These are some of the foremost application of it. Sometimes there will be mistake. When I have mistake, there's a very costly fish here. One of them is maybe $10. And this one is just one dollar. If there's going to be a mistake, where should I throw the mistaken one? I think it's better you put it here because you don't want to put a very a less costly with the most costly. Because the guy who, who purchased this one might complain that you are selling a one dollar fish for me for ten dollars, and not knowing that it was a mistake from the machine learning system. But if you give it to this place, anytime the system is confused, is it air or air? Throw it here. When this one, this man that used to purchase one dollar, uh, one dollar fish, if he happens to find ten dollars fish in his uh, bucket at the end of the day, he will go online to praise your company, thinking that you are donating. He say, "Oh, that company donates fish for us every week, free of free of charge," because they thought it was a delivery thing. But you are not likely to suffer from the uh, customer relation complaint. But for this one. That's why when, when we talk of our machine learning, there's always cost of cost of misclassification. That mistake that are costly. So mistakes are not costly. So if I put a costly fish with the ship one here, of course, as a company, I'm going to lose money. But it's good. But my customer will be happy. But when I put a less, a very cheap fish, and I put it in the customer basket that used to purchase costly fish, there's going to be a problem from the customer point of view. So when you have cost of misclassification, we have to choose the misclassification cost that is lesser. The one we call lesser evil this time around. We always want to have 100% classification, but it's not possible in some cases. There will be mistake. But the mistake, we want it to be on the side that is not costly. For example, someone is sick, it's used your system, and the system says, you, you are not sick. Congratulations. But it's actually sick, but the AI system already missed it. And the person will go home, continue to live a normal life until he or she collapse. This is called false negative, And it's very dangerous in medical applications. But if it is false positive, somebody is not sick, you say, oh, he's sick. You will go to the clinic, check, double check second time. Oh, they say you are free, we are sorry. It was a mistake from the AI system. It's, we don't want any mistake, but this is a better mistake compared to the one that will allow someone to develop complica complications. We have what we call bow surveillance. Bow surveillance is when we use AI to identify disease outbreaks, that disease might break out, like flu. There's some season that when you go out to play in the, bar, in the park, it's a season of the flu. Because like I said, there's some things in the sky in the, that we cannot detect as human beings with ordinary high. It's not possible. It is science, but the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the advancement of science and technology, some data can be gotten, can be gathered from the atmosphere that could actually show that last year when we had this kind of data, there was flu outbreak in that city. So do we need to wait for it again to happen? So we give an alert. Next weekend, there might be flu outbreak. So if you go to the park, try to wear your mask. It's a preventive stuff, at least to reduce the number of people that could be affected. This is called bio-surveillance. We try to detect the disease before it happens. Robotic control, like the autonomous car, have explained this one. Empirical sciences, all our researchers on board, you are chemistry professor, you are chemical engineering, mentioned civil engineering. You go to laboratories sometimes. These are based on my personal experience with some of our colleagues that we work together. One of them actually told me they spend hours in the laboratory to actually estimate only one parameter. For example, you want to know the stress of a material. Let me go to material science now. Stress of material. To know the stress of material, you need to subject the material to some tests. You know more about that. However, there are some basic characteristics of the material that we can get easily. For example, you can get the mass the weight, and some other characteristics of the material. They just put it on the scale, they tell you this information. 
we get this information. Then from previous data, when we have material with this attribute, this is the stress value. When we have another material with this value, this is the stress value. So we have those material from the past. We now told them, can you give us those material in the past? Because this is said, they used to spend a lot of time in the, in the laboratory, trying to detect only one material, some of them, one, only one property. And some of them spend like weeks to get result of like 10 samples out. So we said, if you provide previous data set, we can develop a system that we can predict actually. Since you can easily measure the mass, what is the mass, what is the atomic number, so basic information about this element or these materials, give it to us. We will predict the stress of this, of the strength of the material for this new material without you going to the lab. You can just go to the lab to check, to confirm what we have done. We predict for like 100. You can go and test at random in the laboratory. Maybe they are closer to your expectation. And one of the profs sometimes ago in chemistry specifically, he said he used to spend a lot of time on a particular experiment to get just a property out. And he provided the data, the student worked with him, and then they were able to get very accurate result to the actual, actual result, very close result. He, could, he doesn't want to believe that, is it real? I spent a lot of time in the laboratory doing this. They said, okay, he said, maybe because I gave you the data before. We told him, you gave us data, we divide into two, training and testing. We don't use the testing one for training. So it's not fake. We say, if you doubt it, provide another data you had never provided for us. And he did. And those students took to the laboratory of that professor in, their, in, his, in his own person. They actually tested the new data and it produced excellent results. Since then, he has been a fan of machine learning and he has been using it for some of his predictive solutions. That is to the empirical sciences and also of other where we have empirical works. Information extraction, so many. We just want to search something on the web. We just type. We just get it. We don't know what's going on in the background. At the background, there are a lot of algorithms that are working to look it for you, the best thing you are looking for. Social networks. In social network, we call something sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis. In those days, when you want to know the opinion of people, you give them questionnaire to fill. So when they feed the questionnaire, so you can know the opinion of people. Maybe government want to, for example, maybe a government want to go into nuclear energy, for example. We want to know where, what is the opinion of the citizens regarding this kind of energy. It's good, we know it has some risk. So if you give the questionnaire to people, some people who are opposed to it, they will say, okay, if I say no now, maybe he knows me because he knows the, he can track me and see the way I've answered it. It might not give correct opinion. This is what I'm trying to say. The old questionnaire system is no more working. When somebody is busy and you give him questionnaire, he will say yes, 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 because he knows you want to hear yes. Even when he asks no as answer, it means your data is going to be biased. But with social network analysis in what we call sentiment analysis, it's one aspect of natural language processing under AI, sentiment analysis. We don't need to ask anybody to fill questionnaire. What the government, the government just need to do is to go to their social media and analyze their opinion, actually. Because when you are chatting with your friend online, you are likely to be truthful of what you are talking to your friend. So we okay, what do you say about the government trying to do nuclear energy? You start chatting, oh, we don't like it. Oh, it's good. They can take your opinion from there and they'll be able to know the opinion of people. For example, during the pandemic, the country want to actually check if people are ready to go back to school. They use opinion, social media, uh, social network analysis, sentiment analysis, and it shows that majority of parents are still not ready to go. And it's okay, online school continues. This is the power of sentiment analysis when it comes to this. So it gives you a kind of more accurate information that even the best of question questionnaire administrator will not be able to get it because people will be biased towards you. If they like you, they say yes, yes, yes. But we don't want that. We want something that can give us near accurate state of mind or opinion of people. So machine learning has been used successfully in this area. Debugging, when I want to write my software, I want to have an idea where this error is going to come from. 
it's being used. It tell you the page, the, the line where the error is going to come from, even before you write your software. So because of the software effort prediction, we want to know how many people should I use to develop a particular software. Just like as an, a civil engineer, you can develop a system that can predict how many labor do you need to build this particular, to work in this particular site based on your previous data and it will work for you and it has been successfully used a lot. Predicting the next incident at home. I told us yesterday, even our mothers at home, sisters, they can actually use machine learning to solve some of their challenges, challenging problem at home. Then I say your favorite areas. Just keep thinking of anything you want to do that having a kind of better information about it might work for you. You see machine learning working at that point in time. Uh, because of our time, we just rush over this speech and handwritten recognition, data mining, playing games. People who like games a lot, a lot of machine learning applications. Fault detection. Your car suddenly stopped working. What do you do? You can run your machine learning application to tell you what could be wrong with your car. Industrial automation are there. The industry, the, we have two production systems, like big company like Sabic and the likes. There's a fault. Where is the fault coming? Human being can detect, but it takes them time to trace it out. But machine learning will predict. With this, because of previous experience, previous data, when it happened last time, based on this information, this was what happened. So these are the kind of prediction personally I encourage because it saves your time and saves the resources. So spam email detection, basket analysis, customer relationship management. This is a place that a lot of companies are investing in now. They want to know which customer will run away. You might not know this. We all pass through the implementation every day. When your network provider notice that you are no more buying credits regularly, you, stay, you see them giving you special promotion. Just buy 10, maybe 10 whatever, uh, uh, 10 naira or 10 real uh, credit, we give you 100 for free. They try to encourage because the system is telling them that this customer is about to leave you. This is called customer relationship management. A lot of application of machine learning has been deployed in this area. For example, banking, they lose use the law. They don't want because bank is nothing but customer. If there's no customer in the bank, the bank will fold up. So they don't want to lose, they don't want to lose even a single customer. So they do everything possible to retain you, no matter what they can go, how far they can go. So credit scoring, somebody approached uh, Jai's bank, one of the news bank, new bank now, we know in Nigeria, for example, to be giving loan to people, maybe without, of course, without interest. A lot of people are interested in it. So they want to know how you credit. Are you credit? Uh, are you trustworthy in terms of credit score? If we give you this money, especially it's not having interest, are you going to use? Are you going to return it back? There are a lot of such systems that have been developed. Fraud detection: your card could be compromised. Can we pre predict that this card is being compromised before the transaction actually takes place, based on historical data? All these are getting possible. It's not. It's not looking at unseen. It based on data from the past, actually. So, and we, sometimes we can walk to the back. We call it reverse engineering. You have information in the past. We want to use to know what we might have now. Sometimes we don't know it. We might revive back to the previous. When it happened last time, what was the cause? And then we call it diagnosis. You know, we have for detection and also the diagnosis. Medica, so it's another very odd area that a lot of work are going on. Countries are now dedicated huge money to medical for medical research for AI in medicine because of what potential they have seen in this area that can bring down the cost of medical treatment as you are able to detect people that may be sick at very early stage rather than letting it get later telecommunication web mining the list continues we conclude this application list by saying this applications are diverse you can see how many we have mentioned. There's no time. We can, it's a whole topic on its own that we want to, for those who might be interested, we can check up our, yeah, 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 check up our YouTube uh, videos, uh, Chanel. There was, there was like three or four weeks that we dedicated to 
discussing application of AI. So you see a lot of real life applications that we've discussed in those videos. Then we applications are diverse, but methods are unique or generic. This is the unique thing for you and a good news for you. Even though the applications are so wide, it follows the same principle, generic way of solving them. And that is why it is unique. You can use the same machine learning algorithm like ANN to solve a problem in your civil engineering. The same algorithm can be used to solve another problem in chemical. It will be considered to be a different work entirely because you are using the concept to solve a totally different system because the data here will be different. The data here will be different. And that make a total difference actually. The optimization procedure you're going to use and so many other things will differentiate them. So kindly note this, that the applications though are so many, but the methods are generic. And that's what we just discussed, especially the supervised learning that most of you can find very easy and quick to apply to your own different areas of uh, specialization. Now, the question is when are machine learning algorithms not needed? So when do we not really need machine learning algorithms? I said, when the relationship between all system variables, when you know inputs, you know output, and you know the hidden relationship is completely understood. You have the input in this side, you have the output on this side. There is a relationship that connects them. You can see the connection. This connection, if you know it, then you don't need machine learning. For example, to calculate payroll. For payroll, we know the relationship. Your salary is your basic salary plus the allowances. That's finished. So we don't need machine learning to calculate your salary. We use simple mathematics to do that. However, this is not the case for almost any real system. Most real life systems are more complicated than this. You cannot just render into one plus one. For example, we've been given, somebody is here, how do you know that this, this particular person who is here is diabetic? Because of a particular output, he has one. What is making this person to be diabetic and the other guy is not diabetic? And we have seen several cases that the relationship are so close. Their weight is the same. They come from the same family. Many things are the same to them, but they suffer from different diseases. So it means there's some hidden relationship between them that we don't understand. It is that hidden relationship that machine learning try to bring out because of the science of algorithmic based search. They were able to know that, okay, if this one is this, this is the, the reason why it is there. The information is there, but we human beings don't see it. We cannot see it. And I gave example yesterday that is like the case of hurricane of uh, or yeah hurricane that do happen or tsunami before tsunami happened a lot of things that happened on the sea but we don't know it earthquakes taking place and also for other things but because we don't have the capability to detect them but with science and technology a lot of gadgets now have been installed under the sea that the moment those earthquakes are happening, there will be a lot of alarm being sent to the laboratory that something is happening under the social sea, a social depth, they start monitoring. And before you know what is happening, an alarm will be raised. And they will ask people to start evacuating. You know, this is not knowing the secret of maybe unseen or maybe it's, no, this is practical science. And due to the advancement in the technology of sensor technology, robotics use a lot of sensor. When there was a plane, uh, when there was a plane crash into this, when plane crashed into the sea, they need to locate the wreckage of this plane. How do we locate the wreckage of a plane? You need a lot of sensor to go into the sea and start to throw a lot of signals. If there's a if there's a response from the signal, we say, oh, it's detected. These are basic physics we were taught. We can be able to know the distance between that thing and where we are located. Because it's going to go, the sound will go and return. We calculate it divided by two. This is science. Based on this one, advancement has made it possible to gather enormous amount of data that is now making machine learning to become ubiquitous. Everywhere, everybody wants to take advantage of that particular data. Any company that failed to make use of its data will lose relevance because its competitor will take over from them. So in essence, we are saying in real life, every real system might need machine learning. Relevant disciplines, like 
There are so many things that come together to form what we call machine learning these days. We have algorithms, control, statistics, information theory, dynamic system, neurobiology. In fact, one of the foremost machine learning algorithm we call neural network, artificial neural network. One of the popular neural network, popular artificial machine learning algorithm known as artificial neural network came from neurobiology. You see, they study the way the brain is made, is assembled, and they say, no, we must be able to do some system. And that's a neural network you see connected together, like something similar to the neuron we were taught when we were in secondary school, biology. And one of the foremost forerunners in the system, signal process and also linear algebra. To the mathematician in the house, so we have a lot of mathematics to crack in machine learning. However, the secret is that not everybody needs to really go deeper into that mathematics. It's according to your in interest. If you really like to explore, then you have a lot of mathematical foundation to solve, which is very interesting, by the way. But machine learning, I see it as a tool. It's like a tool. Everybody should be able to, 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 to use it, actually. Without you knowing those mathematics, you can use it successfully. A lot of people have been doing that, actually. However, I want you to know that a lot of mathematical background to machine learning, and they are very deep and very interesting and sophisticated, and so many other areas. You see, researchers in machine learning come from a variety of backgrounds, and this is why the area is getting more richer and richer. So when you get people from different backgrounds together, when you talk of AI, even psychology really play a prominent role in, in, in artificial intelligence. Psychology, philosophy, and so many other fields. They all come together. And that is why AI today is really moving the world. I used to tell people the power of group. Being united, you, are, you can solve a lot of problems. AI has beat any other sector because it combines several fields together to form a single entity. And today, everybody is talking of AI, AI. AI. So like we've mentioned, artificial intelligence with its different field, NLP, robotic, knowledge base, mind with big data, with a lot of potentials. We have the machine learning, which is our concern now, and the deep learning, which is also machine learning, but a subset of machine learning, as the case may be. And briefly to clarify, people get confused. I get a lot of questions on this. Different between machine learning and deep learning. Deep learning is under machine learning. When you have problems that are very that are related to imaging, imaging, imaging videos, you want to classify video, you want to detect image. I recommend deep learning for you because deep learning is very it has the capability to extract image automatically without human intervention. But for machine learning, you need to extract the image yourself and then pass it to the machine learning. But sometimes after extracting the image automatically, you might also use what I call hybrid, combine deep learning with machine learning. Let deep learning extract the feature for you. Let machine learning, ordinary machine learning algorithm, let them do the classification. Because sometimes machine learning algorithms are better in the classification than what a deep learning will do. Because you have a very simple system. You want to classify, you are given data set in the text format. You don't need machine learning. You don't need deep learning, by the way, because this is just maybe you want to predict the strength of a material. And you have those numbers in Excel file. Going for deep learning, to me, is like using a very big stone to kill a fly. You, you risk breaking the table you are killing the fly on or causing other damages. At the end of the day, the fly might actually escape. Just get a very simple broom, the job will be done. This is analogy to deep machine learning and deep learning. When you have simple, simple, simple data set that has nothing to do with imaging and text, yeah, let me add text and also video, then ordinary machine learning algorithm like neural network, KNN, they will do the work even better based on experience because I've seen people use deep learning for simple tasks and they have seen 75% accuracy. We decided to do the same, solve the same problem using simple machine learning algorithm and we got at the, at the minimum, we got in 95% accuracy. So that is just to let you realize they are the same concept machine learning, but one is good at 
a particular area when one is one is more general. So we also mentioned this the relationship between them. The big, the big guy is the AI, the machine learning followed, and you have the deep learning inside machine learning. Tools and models. So towards the end of the class, tools and models. We want us to know that in implementation, these ones are categorized as codeless implementation. You don't need to write code to implement this weaker. Look, we're going to use weaker to demonstrate for us. We don't use, we don't need to write code to use them. That's very self-explanatory. You can easily just click their GUI base. You can click and solve the problem. If your problem has to do with imaging, Lobe will do the work for you. And there are hosts of other methods. But for people who like programming, then you can deep, deep into Python, MATLAB. There are so many versions of them that can solve your machine learning problem. But my concern has always been, I've seen people run away from learning machine learning because it, coding is difficult. They give us, give us Python assignment, I could not do it. And I withdraw from the program. I even after paying for the program, I see this as not necessary. People should be assessed according to their capability. If you want to learn machine learning and you don't have programming experience, go for machine learning without coding. There are so many of them. Even industry are employing people who train in that particular format. But if you know programming or you are interested in programming, then you go do your programming, Python and the likes. You can then use it for your machine learning. Because I see that two parallel things. Machine learning is totally different from coding. You don't know coding, you can do machine learning. One, they are not dependent on each other. So, but people do make this mistake that before you can do machine learning, you need to know coding in Python. And it makes a lot of people to lose the opportunity of getting used to this kind of a very beneficial and a interesting a area of research and applications. So there are other, what we call the no code, uh, no code machine learning tools. There are several others. You see, you can take a look, look at them, monkey learn, create ML, obvious AI, Google Auto ML. These are all tools that you don't need to write codes and they're available. A lot of universities also that are actually promoting no code machine learning concept because they want it to reach out to a lot of people in the community. And uh, towards the end of this particular slide, we say finally, data science, analytics and machine learning. People always ask quest this question that what is data science? What is analytics? What is machine learning? You see, they are connected, but actually data scientists, data science and analytics are the same actually connected. Data scientists use technology to, to look through data, big data, the or small data. And they try to see quantitative risk. What can we make out of this data? And like I mentioned yesterday, data science is old. They used to make use of statistic. It is only the use of machine learning that is recent, actually. So for the analytics, we want to bring together the theory and the practice to identify the effect of what we have done, what we have noticed in the data, what is the effect on the outside world. If you do this, what is going to be the effect to your company or to the environment and the system? That is why data science and analytics, they go together hand in hand. However, machine learning is totally separate. Machine learning is a tool. Just like statistics was being used for data science before, but when data became very big, you need to freeze data for statistics to work. But for big data, it has to be in motion. So machine learning has that capability to discover the relationship between the variables of a system, input, output, and hidden from direct samples of the system. Either the data is frozen or the data is in motion Machine learning has the capability to solve the two of them. And that's what makes a big difference that today people are confusing data science with machine learning because machine learning is now being used a lot, a lot to solve data science problem. I hope that clarifies. And then, ah, yeah, this is what we're gonna have on this particular slide. There are host of several data set because machine learning is all about data set. You need to have the data set so that you can be able to implement some of the algorithms. So you can check out data set, they are free. You see the UCR repository has a lot of free 
data set there. So and we have the the, the Kagu. Kagu is very popular. Regularly bring out a lot of competition. If you are interested, you can form a group. You can compete to win a lot of awards by solving problem for people. Actually, you solve problem for people. For example, there was a time that uh, one of the very powerful I mean, Netflix brought in a kind of uh, if you can if you if you can improve our rating AI system by just ten percent, we give you one. Was it not $1 million? It was a very, very popular kind of competition. People tried to come up with different solutions that can solve the problem. Finally, people came out with Ensemble that was able to solve the problem. We explained that also in some of our previous uh, engagements. Uh, more data set, I listed them there. We can explore it. Also, some of the journals that's related to AI as the case uh, may be.